Let's talk about heat exchangers. What does a heat exchanger look like? How do you design them? What are the characteristics you need to figure out? And how do you calculate the surface area you need in a heat exchanger for a certain problem? The basic design of a heat exchanger is that you have an apparatus that have a wall in it that divides the apparatus into two different sections. So you have the warm medium on one side and then the cold medium on the other side. And this wall that divides uh, the, uh, the apparatus, it's through that wall that this heat transfer occurs. But what can they look like? Look at this picture here. Do you see a heat exchanger here? Well, I actually see two, at least. The legs. If you think of a bird uh, standing on an ice uh, sheet in the winter, you probably have seen how they raise one leg and stand on one, uh, one foot and then they shift and then stand on the other. What's going on there? Well, the thing is that the temperature of the foot is lower than the temperature of the body and the warm uh, oxygenated blood goes down to the foot through the leg in an artery and then the blood is cooled down by the surrounding and then it, the cold blood is going up again in a vein and those two flows meet so the warm blood can transfer some of, of its heat to the cold blood even though the two flows are separated in the leg that's a heat exchanger right But what kind of wish list can you have for heat exchangers? What is the perfect heat exchanger? What kind of design parameters are there? Well, one perhaps obvious design parameter is the area. If you have a radiator at home, which I think you have, uh, what is the size of the radiator? A small radiator will not transfer as much heat as a big uh, radiator, right? Uh, so that's one important thing. But the area of the radiator, that's also through that which uh, the heat transfer occurs, right? So the material of that wall is important. Things like the heat conductivity, the resistance to corrosion, the resistance to high pH values, the resistance to low pH values, the resistance to high pressure, and high temperatures and even the thickness is important here I mean you might think that okay uh, I would like to have a thin wall because if you think of going outside uh, during the winter I think you would prefer a thick jacket right because that gives you more insulation uh, but with heat exchangers it's the opposite you want to have a thin wall because then heat is transferred easily when if it's thick wall then the heat has a long way to go, right? But if you also want it to resist high pressure then you're into problems because a thin wall won't withstand as much pressure as a thick wall. So you need to optimize for your specific solution. And speaking about optimizing, another thing is that in the overall design of your heat exchanger, you will need to decide on things like how big should the transaction be uh, in which the flow is flowing. If you chose uh, a big transaction, then you get turbulent flow. And turbulent flow is good because you get higher heat transfer in, in such a flow than if you have tiny uh, channels, then you get more laminar flow. But on the other hand, if you have a thick transaction, then the heat needs to go from the middle to the periphery. and So there is an optimum there, right? Uh, and to optimize things like the overall heat transfer coefficient for your problem, uh, we will assume that you have perfect mixing in the channels, but that might not be the case. If you have honey, for example, on one side, honey is gooey, has high viscosity, there might be problems with that. Uh, that you, the flow becomes laminary and then you need to calculate the heat transfer within the liquid as well. And speaking about honey, uh, how easy it is, is it to clean uh, this heat exchanger? Well that depends on the design. Uh, can you take it apart and clean it? 
does it become dirty easily or is the design such that it doesn't become dirty so easily? But these with the flaws, there is another thing, another design issue there, and that's what are the directions of the flaws relative to each other? When we talked about the legs of a bird, we said that one flow goes in one direction and the other flow goes in another direction, so we have a counter current setup. But we could also have a co-current setup, or we could have a cross-current setup, or we can have some kind of strange mixture between all three of those. And actually at the lab you will see one example where you have a mixture of everything. And there are ways to do calculations for those as well, and you can see that in the handbook, but we don't cover that so much in this course. We will just mention that there are problems here. And speaking of heat transfer coefficients, I should say one thing as well. that. We, in our course, will say that, okay, we have one overall heat transfer coefficient, but that might not be the case. You might actually have different heat transfer coefficients along the, the heat exchanger, so that's a bit of a problem. Overall heat transfer coefficient is a very important parameter uh, for calculating the surface area. But how do you do that? How do you calculate surface area? You need to make an energy balance. So the heat that goes from the hot medium goes through the wall and then into the cold medium. And we will assume that there are no heat losses, so all the energy goes from the hot medium to the cold. And you can describe the energy that goes through this wall as the overall heat transfer coefficient times the area times the temperature difference between the hot medium and the cold medium. But if we look at the heat exchanger and look at how the temperature change along the heat exchanger, it might look like this. Uh, so the hot medium uh, is decreasing in temperature and the cold medium is increasing in temperature. But the difference between the two change along the heat exchanger. And note here that for the four different temperature difference that you need to keep track of, the temperature difference in the hot medium and the temperature difference in the cold medium. So how much, that, that's a measure of how much energy is transferred from the hot medium to the cold medium. And then you have the temperature difference between the hot and the cold medium on one side and the temperature difference between the hot and the cold on the other side of the heat exchanger. And in the K times A times delta T equation, it's the temperature difference between the two media that we need to have but it might change along the heat exchanger. So how do you deal with that? Well, if you have a situation where you have essentially constant heat capacities on both sides, they might not be the same, it doesn't have to be the same uh, fluxes on either side, but if they are reasonably constant heat capacities on both sides, then one can derive a logarithmic mean temperature uh, and that looks like this. So it's delta T2 minus delta T1 divided by the natural logarithm of the delta T2 divided by delta T1. And due to the logarithmic laws, you can actually rewrite this as delta T1 minus delta T2 divided by the natural logarithm of delta T1 divided by delta T2. We talked about co-current and counter-current setup, and I said that co-current is not as good as counter-current, usually. Uh, and that's because you get a higher logarithmic mean temperature if you have a counter-current setup uh, than if you have a co-current setup. Why is that? Well, consider these two uh, situations. In both cases, we have a hot medium that goes in at 220 degrees and goes out at 120 degrees. So it loses 100 degrees Celsius. And there is a cold medium that enters at 20 degrees and exits at 90 degrees. What is the logarithmic mean temperature in these two cases? Try to calculate that. Pause here and try to calculate it. Well, in the co-current setup, we have a large delta T1. So it's 220 minus 20, so we have 200 degrees. But delta T2 is much smaller, 120 minus 90 is only 30. And the logarithmic mean temperature then becomes 200 minus 30 divided by 
the natural logarithm of 200 divided by 30 and we get 89.6. If you take the same values for the counter current setup, you instead get 130, so not as much as 200 uh, on one side, but you get 100 on the other side. And if you take the logarithmic mean temperature of that, you get 114 degrees. So the counter current uh, setup is much better. You can also think of what is the limit. If I have an infinitely large heat exchanger, how far can I get? If I have a cold current setup, how much can I heat the cold medium? Well, you see delta T2 decreases uh, uh, the longer heat exchanger you have. And the limit is when delta T2 is zero. So the hot medium has the same temperature as the cold, uh, the outgoing uh, hot medium. But in the counter current setup, if you have an infinitely long heat exchanger, what happens is that you can actually take the cold medium all the way up to 220 degrees. You need an infinitely large area, right? But the limit is much, much higher uh, than in the co-current setup. So that's also a reason why counter-current setup is better in most cases. Note that if we have phase changes on both sides, we typically don't have a varying temperature difference. I mean, if you condense something, you condense something at the specific temperature uh, if you have uh, the same pressure all over.